Today, you'll recognize from the uh, backdrop that I'm in Cape Town, South Africa. I'm here for the Africa um, Oil Week conference, our next video in the How Oil Fields Work series. So today we're going to look at depth. Now, other videos in this series are listed here, and there's going to be a growing number of those as we go forward. We've got one coming up soon, which is on reserves and CPRs, so watch out for that. So today, we're going to look at depth. Well, this should be a short video. Surely this is so simple, it's a trivial subject. Well, let's have a look at our model here, and let's find out what depth is in a well. So uh, here you can see our model. We've got water, shale, and sandstone. And we're going to drill our well, and we're going to look at the various depth measurements. Well, the first depth that we look at is, is called the measured depth, or the driller's depth. Now this is commonly, it is measured from the rig floor and it goes all the way down to whatever level you're actually measuring to. Often it's measured in feet MD or measured depth. Obviously it could be meters as well. The uh, true vertical depth is normally referenced to a, a subsea datum. So it's from the, uh, the, the sea level all the way down to again whatever depth that you are measuring to and commonly that's written as feet tvd sub c or sometimes feet sub c ss ftss now when the well gets to the maximum depth that it's going to attain that's called total depth or it's known as td so the well has reached td now here you can see that often we're looking at a an interval of interest which would be defined as the top reservoir and a base reservoir. And we're interested in the thickness. And uh, we're going to show you some of the subtleties and some of the strange things that happen when you're measuring depth. Now, I'm not going to cover in this video some more obscure things like wireline depth and quarter log depth shifts and why we would actually quote uh, total vertical depth RKB. And we'll come on to what that is. But for now... What we're going to do is we're going to start off by looking at this area. This is sort of sometimes known as the, the air gap, or it's the gap from the sea level all the way up to the rig floor. Now, oil rigs come in all shapes and sizes. Here you can see a, a jack-up rig, and uh, the rig floor would probably be somewhere around about here on this particular rig. Here on the uh, semi-submersible, the rig floor would be somewhere in there. I can't quite make out where it would be. And finally, here's a fantastic photograph. Um, I think this is from the Mariner platform in the North Sea. And you can see that uh, here, the drilling derrick is actually sort of sitting on quite a number of floors up above the, uh, the sea. And this is a fixed platform here, actually fixed to the seabed. The jackup is also, uh, these legs go all the way down to the seabed. But in the case of the uh, semi-submersible, there are pontoons underneath, and this actually floats and, and is anchored into position. So that's one of the key differences. But in each and every one of them, the drill floor varies in height between the installations. So what is the datum for a well? Well, commonly, the depths are referred to as RKB or BRT. So this refers to the datum. RKB is relative to Kelly Bushing, BRT below rotary table. Now, here's a picture of a rig floor, and uh, here's the drill pipe going round. Now, this is the table that rotates, and uh, this is the rotary table. So this is what turns the, uh, the drill pipe around. But much of the drill pipe is round, as you can see. So although we can't see it here, in a, another part of the system, there is a often square Kelly, as it's known, and this fits into here, so that actually you can change the rotating motion of the rotary table and actually get it to spin the pipe by basically locking it in here with a square-sided Kelly. Now, in modern rigs, a top drive system is used. Often there may still be a rotary table as a backup, but in this scenario, this is the motor here that actually spins the pipe and actually very, very, very powerful motors. But often as not, the datum is still the drill floor or, or the rotary table being essentially one and the same. Now, I think this here is a Kelly bushing, but it is typically what they look like. They probably are about a foot high and they basically slot into holes in the rotary table and actually... That's what uh, causes, as I said earlier, the, the pipe to spin. 
So what about water depth? Well, we use the classification of water depth in Trove, where uh, anything less than 1,000 feet is referred to as shallow, between 1,000 and 5,000 feet deep water, and greater than 5,000 feet, um, it's ultra deep water. Uh, I think this is a fairly widely accepted system in the industry. And uh, here's a couple of examples. Two wells here, the well on Jabba One, which was drilled in Block 48 in Angola by the Maersk Voyager in 2021. And that drilled in a water depth of some 11,900 feet. It actually took the record from another Total Energies operated well, which was the Raya One well drilled offshore Uruguay by uh, the Maersk Venture back in 2016. Uh, and that drilled in uh, 11,150 feet of water. Now, unfortunately, uh, both of these wells were reported as dry holes. But uh, certainly, exploration is moving into deeper water. And there is uh, a lot of success uh, internationally. Let's have a look at water depth. Now, when we're talking about water depth, we've got to take into account that the sea isn't still. We have tides coming in and out. So often when we're talking about the data, we're referring to a mean sea level. With weather, of course, you know, we can get some very, very dramatic storms. And uh, we have to have sort of compensators on rigs as they move up and down, whereas the the drill string must actually uh, essentially stay constantly or in a constant position and constant weight on, on bottom, particularly when you're drilling. And on land, the data may be just a local data, or again may use uh, mean sea level. So um, units, well, no surprises here, but of course in North America and, and in areas of the world where North American companies have worked, you know, imperial systems uh, are used and it's fair enough. Texas was the birthplace of the modern oil industry. And in lots of parts of the rest of the world, then the, the metric systems adopted. Uh, it was all, almost adopted in the USA in the 1970s, but uh, it didn't happen. And it seems unlikely to happen uh, anytime soon. So companies may have standards. Some will use meters, but they may also use uh, the local scheme for whatever country they're in. And it seems appropriate if, um, for example... You know, every well in a basin uh, is, is reported in feet to, to come in and just start using meters. It, it just puts everything out of sync. Now, in Trove, we capture both and uh, ready. Obviously, it isn't rocket science to go between the two, but uh, worth having. But now we want to introduce some other concepts to do with depth. And this is when you have deviated wells or dipping beds. Here's a vertical well, and you can see I'm using these little red bars. And you can see in this case... The thickness that's measured in this well is about one and a half units, one and a half red bars. And this is what we refer to as the true vertical thickness or isochore wells. Now, we could drill a deviated well down here, down dip. And in that scenario, the same thickness of rock is now two units thickness. And that's an apparent vertical thickness. Or we could drill it up dip like this and we could actually measure it and find it's only one red bar an apparent vertical thickness here that varies between one, one and a half, and two. But what is the truth? Well, the truth is, if we measured here, across and perpendicular to the bed, and this is a uniform bed, we have a true stratigraphic thickness, or an isopack. And here it measures uh, one and a bit. So depending on how you measure something, you can get some very different measurements. Here you can see that the actual length that you encounter, we refer to as the along hole length, or AHL. Let's introduce some geology. So essentially we're going to drill the same three wells here. In fact, we're going to come up with the same three numbers. But what you're going to see that's different is that we're looking at some very variable thicknesses of the rock. And this particular image here is supposed to represent a stratigraphic pinch out. So the isopack, the, the thickness of the sandstone unit that we're depicting here, is actually uh, changing. So perhaps it's more often that we should quote a range, but the range can go from zero to more than two of our red bars. That kind of can be a, a little bit meaningless and uh, quoting an average well that, that can be quite dangerous and equally as meaningless so um, the problem with deviated wells so many of the wells that we drill we actually target particular parts of the reservoir so here we're trying to maximize the exposure 
of the hole to the uh, the sandstone formation and in so doing we've built up the angle uh, we're staying sort of parallel to the roof of this particular sandstone unit and then we we pop out here so in this well we've got two tops now there are different ways to measure depth and calculate true vertical depth and the the azimuth and step out for a well which are using different methods now there are several but uh, this there's two radius of curvature and minimum curvature now different uh, methods yield different uh, depths so effectively here we're, we're drilling what is a, a bed parallel well and if this bed was flat we'd call it a horizontal well that we're drilling but here you know it's kind of going along the bedding plane as it were but we end up with a, an incomplete penetration so we never really find out just how thick this particular unit is now another one of the drawbacks sometimes with horizontal wells and here we've introduced a, a mid reservoir shale here which is a ceiling uh, shale you can see that again we penetrate the, uh, the top of the reservoir at this depth here um, we start to go into this shale but we steer up from it and uh, again we go out through the roof of the reservoir now why we might do this is to get better production performance um, having more a long hole length means that we can get a higher pr productivity index a lower drawdown uh, essentially we, we get more permeability feet of reservoir but we do unfortunately have a limited understanding of our reservoir thickness another drawback is that say we had this column down here full of oil then our well wouldn't actually be penetrating that and wouldn't be draining it now in this scenario here we've not only just uh, gone horizontal but we've actually geosteered steered the well so we can try and steer the well horizontally and here we've gone in and we've taken both the upper sand and the lower sand and we've come back through the reservoir and we've gone up the stratigraphy again and come back out through the roof so we've got another top reservoir pick here second and then we've overshot the top of the reservoir so we steer down and then we we encounter the reservoir for a third time now you obviously get more than one vertical depth for, for top reservoir in a well here we've got at least three and it can get quite confusing and it's sort of easy to get lost but other techniques are employed like uh, biostratigraphy or some other local knowledge which um, might uh, help the geologist interpret uh, what sands that they are in but in the last 25 years there have been many advances in geosteering and imaging tools so that they are great for thin reservoirs. We can also maximize the offset. We can stay away from the oil water contacts. We can stay away from the water and keep the well in the oil leg and as high in the oil leg as we can get. So we stay close to the roof of the reservoir. Now, these are some of the tools that are used and you can see this well here is, is drilling from left to right and this image unfolds as we drill the well and you can see that by steering we can actually see at any point in time that we're getting close to the base of the reservoir or equally we can see that we're approaching the top of the reservoir so, so we would know when to steer up and then to steer back down and try and stay within the reservoir interval. Now, when we actually look at the logs from a well like this, and here's the well trajectory, you can see that in this scenario, we get some very, very sort of drawn out logs, logging tools. Of course, the, the electric logs are actually looking essentially perpendicular to, to the well bore, so they're actually looking vertically. Now, they don't look very far into the formation, but they tend not to change very much over hundreds of feet of penetration, so quite difficult to make uh, correlations of, of zones, particularly with nearby vertical wells. So really, these can only be effectively visualized in either a two-dimensional, like here, or a sort of three-dimensional modern workstation which enables uh, geoscientists to fly through the reservoir. But one plea, and that is uh, geoscientists who use these things on a daily basis are incredibly uh, used to them, but uh, you can make others feel very, very dizzy when you're actually watching these. So my plea would be make a short video. Live demos uh, rarely work as intended and don't want to lose the point while you're trying to drive and demonstrate. So what are the deepest wells? Well, Onshore, the Bertha Rogers in Oklahoma actually drilled down to 32,000 feet, of which about 31,500 feet was the TVD sub-sea depth. Now, that well actually reached TD in molten sulfur. 
Now, geologically, probably one of the deepest well has been Project Moho in the Pacific Ocean. Now, it was drilled between 1961 and 1966 when when funds effectively ran out. Now, it only drilled to 12,601 feet, and 12,000 feet of that was actually water, but it did actually come just over 3,000 foot short of the Moho, the Mohorovic discontinuity. That's the point that defines the the base of the crust and the, the start of the mantle. So geologically, that would have been the deepest. However, the deepest research well, which was basically drilling to see how deep a well could be drilled, was on the Kola Peninsula near Mamansk in Russia, and it drilled to 40,000 feet, which is like eight miles or over 12 kilometers, until the drill got stuck in the hole. Now, at TD, the, the temperatures were recorded as 190 degrees centigrade or 370 degrees Fahrenheit. And the oil and gas arena... The Chevo 014 production well uh, off the Sakhalin Island in Russia in the uh, Chevo field, this well measured 49,000 feet, which is almost 15 kilometers. Now, completed in 2017 by Rosneft and uh, Exxon, it beat uh, the five previous record holding deepest wells, but they were all in the same field. Interestingly, the depths of these are actually less than a kilometre, so they are very, very major step outs so that go on for, you know, probably the best part of 14 kilometres away from the drill centre. The deepest well, well, we believe at this time it was uh, in the Tiber field and it was drilled by uh, BP in the Gulf of Mexico uh, to around about 35,000 feet, and that was uh, its true vertical depth. It was drilled with the uh, the deep water horizon rig, and and for comparison, there's the height of Mount Everest at just over twenty nine thousand feet or eight point eight five kilometers. So in summary, why have we spent time explaining such a, a trivial issue and a, a simple concept uh, like depth? Well. Because like most things in life, the, the devil is in the detail. There are lots of nuances, variants and subtleties as you start looking into depths and thicknesses. Now imagine how much more difficult it is to describe more complex concepts. Uh, examples being a working petroleum system or, or how to uh, classify oil and gas reserves. When all these variables are going on with something as simple as depth. These are subjects we're going to follow up on in later videos. So thank you for watching. Please hit the like, subscribe and ring the bell. And uh, hope to see you back on our channel before too long. Bye for now.